success for me was being able to create a, a narrative and a platform to be able to share what was really true to me. And through my art, I'm able to do that. And that's the success. That's all I need to be able to do that. It's not a money metric. It's not a, uh, a clout or fame metric. It's simply the idea of being able to wake up every single morning and keep doing what I want to do. And that for me has been amazing. Hey guys, welcome to the Tom Ward Show where each week we talk to some of the most successful people in the world. It's time to level up. Today we've got Devin DeJardin, artist. Um, we're in his beautiful studio in little Tokyo, LA. We'll get some insert B-roll here, Michael. We'll get <laughs> some B-roll of the studio, but you know, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. Now you have the wildest story of how you even got into this mm. your origin story is like otherworldly so tell like tell us how you even started painting i was going through instagram i had probably four or five thousand followers at the time um, i had this random dm from a guy named zach love in indiana uh, who's now a friend of mine but at the time was completely completely random guy mid-30s lived on a farm um was like hey man i'll pay you 100 bucks to talk to you i was like <laughs> i was like big red flag big red flag yeah what do you think yeah. like dick pics we laugh about it together all the time now but i was like you know shit, i'm kind of broke because i've wasted all my money on clothing i'm living in my friend's apartment sleeping on his couch yeah um i gotta pay off my student loan soon what am i gonna do and i said well 100 bucks is gonna get me groceries for the week if anything gets weird i'm hanging up and i'm blocking the number <laughs> all right um so I jumped on the phone call with him and he, you know, just had this kind of assertiveness and this, in this like calmness in, in a sense to his voice. And he said, you know, I've been following you for a while. Um, you know, I, I feel like you're interested in, in creative things. Um, by any chance, did you study religion or spirituality or philosophy in, in school? And I was like, yeah, I, I just, uh, I just finished studying that. And he goes, well, I, I know this might sound weird, but you know, I've been thinking about you and, and something out there is telling me to tell you to start painting. And I was like, uh, OK, that's kind of weird. And he's just like, you know, do me a favor, like pick up a canvas and just start start trying. It's like, OK, I'll, I'll check back in with you. And that was the phone call. And so. So wait, hold on. Before you even move on to yeah, your story, yeah. like you get off the phone call, you got yeah. 100 bucks. You're yeah, like, I, remember I got the Venmo. You could have like, immediately right. said you could have went like two ways. You could have gone. All right, that guy's insane yeah like why is he why is some dude in indiana thinking of me in the yeah. first place right so that's strange like i'm just gonna keep trying to the clothing thing happen or yeah. the other side could go like be open to it and, like some random i mean it's the most random thing was i've very, ever yeah. heard of yeah i mean i think it was it was unsettling but at the same point i feel like and a lot of i guess my story post that conversation is just you have these little nudges from people in your life that feel almost like a divine moment. And I, and, you know, divine moment can be kind of misconstrued in so many ways and manufactured due to how we want things to work. Sure. But, you know, I think there is these moments where they kind of poke you and you, and you have this gut feeling and this kind of overwhelming sensation that, yeah, maybe this is right. And for me, that's what happened in the conversation. And it doesn't even make sense. Like mm. you say, okay, yeah, we all have these little moments, you know, like, hey, something my, something my gut feels like if I take this job, it'll mm. work out for me or something like that. Yeah. But there's never, I need like a direct sign yeah. from God. Like I need somebody to call me and go do yeah. this. And like you got hit over the head with it. Like there yeah. was no, there was nothing subtle about this at all. Not at all. It was like an actual guy hitting you up, calling you, yeah. go buy a canvas and paint like now. Yeah. And you listened. Yeah. And it, it wasn't like an immediate response of like, hey, I'm just going to be a painter all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. I, I remember I went and bought the canvas. I was, you know, I'm not joking. It was North Hollywood. I had a friend named Brian. He was working at like an art school randomly enough. And he's like, come crash on my couch. I was applying after the clothing to be like a medical salesman, suit and tie <laughs> job, going into these interviews, like so lost and just confused. And um, I was like, you know what? Maybe I just need to take this step and see what happens. Like, I got nothing else to lose at this point mm -hmm. before I go give it to like the corporate man. Yeah, yeah. And um, I just I started messing around. And it's funny because you know so much of the work now that we'll talk about is you know using shapes. And I remember I did this monochromatic kind of print on a 20 by 20 inch canvas, and it was like triangle, circle, square, triangle, circle, square, and it was kind of this cool like you know monogram print and i sent him a picture i was like what do you think man like thinking like this is going to be the moment like yeah. it's all hit and he's like yeah keep going who who did you send the dude in so, yeah i was like hey I, is I he like him. an art guy yeah he's an artist himself oh, he's an okay. incredible artist and he's just like 
you know, early in my career and still now has been such a, a voice, you know, and stuff like a supportive voice. And he's wild and eccentric and super fun, but he's just given that like initial jab, like you can do this, like keep trying, keep trying. And I think everyone in life needs a friend like that at certain moments to be like, hey, like, come on, let's go. For sure. And that's for me, that was him at that moment. Dude, I get people who hit me up, a lot of people in their 20s, like watch or listen to this. Mm. And I always, I laugh when they hit me up and say this because me now, I'm 45, like yeah. looking at my somebody in their 20s is like young to me. But mm. when you're in your 20s, it doesn't seem young. It seems like I got to figure everything yeah. out like right now. People always hit me up. It's like, hey, I'm 25. You know, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm 27. You know, I yeah. don't know what the next right move is. Like, do you have a message for them? Like. The, just you yeah imagine you doing the the job interviews with the medical salesperson yeah. and trying to figure out this other passion on the side like i think it's just important to have um openness to knowing that like what we think sometimes is our right path mm -hmm. like there's so much more out there and there's so many different inspirations and so many different outlets that can potentially turn into something that we're destined to be doing and um I think a lot of people close themselves off due to the need for security and need for affirmation and need for validation. And I think the moment you do that, it can really limit, you know, potentially a door that you've always should have been opening, you know, to arise. There's this guy, Alex Ramosi, I interviewed him mm -hmm. and he had, a, he had a great quote I saw on Twitter, which said like, you know, you can outwork 99% of the people out there if you just continue to show up when you're not seeing immediate results yeah like and i really thought about consistency. that consistency that ain't easy so. to do because a lot of people go like i tried to die for a week didn't yeah. work it you know what i mean yeah. or like i went to the gym three days whatever you know or mm. they never kind of can push without having that immediate yeah. you know gratification or feedback mm -hmm. like you were just painting on the side there was no was there other than were you getting that from that guy in indiana that kind of Positive yeah, reinforcement? Yeah, I, I was getting that positive reinforcement. I mean, I, I definitely will say I have a great group of friends that I've built over the years that all are very supportive and everyone's kind of in their own creative field and doing clothing or art or business and tech and all these different outlets and music. And, you know, having that around you allows you to feel that, you know, I can keep going with this because it's, it's, it's kind of normalized. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I mean, it's just it's. It's a, it's a, it was a wild start. I don't know. So go back. So stay back there for a yeah. sec. So you're in LA, you're painting. Now you came down, you were making clothes for influencers, right? That's kind of what you were doing. Yeah, it was, it was kind of a mix of two things. I had a brand that I started with my brother in high school. I was like 15. We were like the kids in high school printing on t-shirts. Nice. It was right when like Mac Miller and Wiz and all these people were kind of making these cool, like kind of, you know, like you look at like zoomies and vans and like hot topic back in the day. It was like yeah. the graphic t-shirt was such a big thing. And, um, my brother was really skilled in graphic design and I always felt like I was good at bringing people together and, and helping guide telling a story to make it like brandable. Mm -hmm. And um, I did that for, you know, five, 10 years. I was like doing it all the way up into like my sophomore year of college. And then when I came down here, we're like, hey, how can we kind of create different linear markets within this branding or within this brand? And we said, okay, it was kind of before all the influencers had merged. It was before all like the kind of celebrities had their own apparel lines and makeup and all that stuff. And I said, oh, I'll be really interesting to like help them. And the one thing that we did is we just never really asked for anything back. We said, hey, we have this opportunity to help you out. If you want to build this, we can do it for like a very, 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 very low percent. I'm talking we made nothing doing it. Hence oh, wow. why I was sleeping on a friend's couch. <laughs> um, but I just, we just thought you know this would be a good test to see if it's possible so i met a lot of people doing that here in la and just helping build their brands and ultimately that made me really hate i was just saying like, just because it's like what was it like dealing with influence <laughs> i interviewed for years there's, yeah i mean yeah, any horror stories <laughs> there's a lot of horror stories um but i think every individual is different there's people i've worked with that are great and i'm sure you've worked with people that are great of course and you work with people that are a disaster and it's those those moments really kind of take it out of you and if you have a couple of those back to back you're just like yeah i think i should probably pivot at this point was there anything specific without naming names that happened uh yeah but okay i'm, I'm on ndas and all that stuff oh, so okay. i'm just like that's yeah. fair all right <laughs> this is not worth it but i, I you know I, I was i learned so much during that process i learned how to deal with people i learned how to tell multiple different stories from multiple you probably learned social media points. yep a little bit i still social media is such a a tricky thing and such a mind in my opinion, but um, it was a really 
fast intro to LA. I'll put it that way. It was like, hey, here's LA in ego. Here's LA in, in the worst form. Here's LA in the best form. Like, let's just hear it all is. Mm -hmm. Do you want to be here? Do you want to live here? Do you want to do it? And I'm like, I don't know if I want to do this. <laughs> and that's that moment that phone call happened. So I was like, I was really low. I was really, really low at that. And I was like, I need to move home kind of situation. Wow. Yeah. If I'm getting a hundred bucks for, for groceries and taking a phone call, like that's where it was at. So you're in LA and I love the struggling, you're a starving artist. Like you were legit yeah. a starving artist. Yeah. But you were, first of all, shout out Donnie Namias, yeah. right? You guys, mm -hmm. and which wild to me. So you guys are crashing on a couch. You got a little place together, right? Yeah, so we actually moved in. I met Donnie through the rounds of doing clothing downtown. And we had a friend that was a, a sales rep for Donnie who was also helping me sell my clothes at the time. And he was like, can you go meet up with Donnie? Like he needs some help with a photo shoot. And I was like, yeah, sure. Like he's gonna pay you 500 bucks. So, okay, I never got paid Donnie, just letting <laughs> you know. He never paid me. So that's always a funny story. But we met up and I was like, wow, I feel like I'm like staring at my twin brother. Like he's doing stuff that I feel like I'm doing. He's way more skilled at it, way more knowledgeable, but like we should definitely like, you know, be friends. Cause I think there'll be beneficial aspects to it. And I didn't realize that he was driving up from Santa Barbara to LA every single day. And I was sleeping on my friend's couch and I was like, bro, should we just get a place together? Like, should we move in? We met each other maybe two weeks before that conversation happened. Oh, wow. And he's like, yeah, but like, I'm strapped. And I'm like, well, I'm strapped. I was like, I have this other friend that also wants to move in. I was like, there's this one bedroom. Should we just do it? And we got this one bedroom with three guys. One dude was in the kitchen. Me and Donnie were like <laughs> twin matches on the floor, side by side, just trying to scrape by to like be able to stay in LA and yeah. figure it out. I mean, this is six seven years ago um but that moment i think is like also a determining factor for a lot of different people's personalities it's like if you're willing to kind of hang in there like we're talking about and and strap it out and you see the vision you see like where you want to be i think that always will outweigh those difficult times well first of all i should have mentioned donnie namia is founder of the namia's clothing brand yeah would you, would you call it a like premium streetwear yeah. brand i don't know i'd fashion. say it's like luxury menswear luxury menswear yeah. there you go everybody check them out yeah but so you're also working so you mentioned before with la like you saw kind of the the ego hollywood kind of life and then you know the good side of it too you were yeah. working at the chateau marmont yeah which i mean it's is a you know, infamous hotel in LA. I mean, mm -hmm. going back to the 60s and 70s, you didn't have yeah. everyone from Sinatra to Elvis in there. Yeah. Even now you got George Clooney and DiCaprio hanging out at the bar. So yeah. you guys were bartending there, right? Yeah, I got a, I wanted something that was flexible and needed money because like the clothing stuff wasn't paying the bills. Yeah. Like the start of art wasn't paying bills. Like this was so early into it. And I was like, I need something flexible, but I know that the Chateau like pays well and it's a really cool spot. For and sure. And I went like multiple weeks in a row to just go and I sat in the, in the lobby with a little dress shirt on and a tie and slacks and was like, can I speak to the manager? Can I speak <laughs> to the manager? And finally, like um, the woman that ran, like I think it was the catering department, she huh? came out and was like, okay, we have a job. You know, you can come in here, you can start bartending, you can do whatever, help out with the events. And, um, I got in there and I was like, yo, this is wild. It was like the craziest job to have it. I thought it was so fun. I still say to this day, like if someone was like, you want to come back for a night? I was like, yeah, yeah. Like it's, <laughs> I was just a really cool way to kind of have a bird's eye view on Hollywood, not being from here and yeah. seeing it all unfold. And then quickly, Donnie, I think was actually at working at the Four Seasons doing the same thing. I was like, yo, you got to come over to Chateau. Like it's so fun here, like whatever. <laughs> so we both got in there and we were running like night shifts catering for like after parties and random hotel room things it was it was it was a wild time but it allowed us both to have a little bit of money to inject into like painting or inject into clothing um and then also like still afford to be in this little one bedroom all together so yeah yeah it was it was a really cool time um, did you ever like see celebrities like doing they shouldn't like party hard and I mean, stuff. yeah it's like it's the it's the most infamous hotel i think here with all the crazy stories like i think all I can say is what you probably hear goes on there, definitely goes on there. <laughs> so like, I was curious too, um, I've heard a couple stories from that place. And what I'm always amazed with is, you know, you know, celebrity A is there doing blow at four o'clock in the morning with someone mm. who's not his wife. And, you know, yeah. they're running around like that. How does like the bartender or waitress not call TMZ? Like, how does that stuff stay out? I think it's just a respect thing. I think people that want to stir up other people's lives got a lot of issues of themselves oh, so it's like sure. you know obviously there's contracts and ndas and all that stuff but like oh, i guess so, i yeah. think just there's a there's a 
um, a pride and a and a security with that place that's been held forever. And gotcha. It's just like stay out of other people's business. I think that's just like a life lesson. I don't need to share what other people are doing, and you don't need to share what I'm doing. It's just like that's your life. You handle it. You do your thing, and yeah. I'm, I'm gonna be over here and I'll, I'll serve you your cocktail. <laughs> you know what's wild? Like, you know, yeah, you guys slugged it out and mm-hmm. slept on the, in the one bedroom apartment. I'm talking about you and Donnie, and which wild is now you're both wildly successful really mm. by any metric you use to track it right yeah. um you know he's wildly successful with his clothing brand you know i love love his clothes yeah. and he's got the nba wearing his clothes <laughs> right everyone. now which is wild yeah. you've got you know tech billionaires you know you know getting their paintings in your in their your paintings in their house mm. what made you guys different than everybody else who comes to la for a dream yeah how many people today right now yeah you know, got to LA, they're in Hollywood somewhere, you know, they're yeah. staying in like a short term motel or something <laughs> until they figure it out. Yeah. Like what makes you guys different than everyone else who does it yeah. and then goes home? I think it's a two part answer to that question. I think success is also determined by like your own personal standards, you know, like success for me was being able to create a, a narrative and a platform to be able to share what was really true to me. And through my art, I'm able to do that. And that's the success. That's all I need to be able to do that. It's not a money metric. It's not a, uh, a clout or fame metric. It's simply the idea of being able to wake up every single morning, keep doing what I want to do. And that for me has been amazing. I think Donnie would say the same is like just being able to create clothing every single day is successful to him. He could care less about all the glitz and glam. It's just the fact that he gets to design and be in a studio with a team of people and, and lead the charge on that. Um, I think what would make us different, I think that we just understood and have stayed being able to understand that if we keep our head down, things will work out. And I think if you treat people well, you're generous with your time and your money, you lift people up and you also bring other people up with you, that you'll always be able to win. And people give up all the time and things get rough. It's not like you just get to a certain platform, everything's good it's like it, there's another challenge and i'd say it's even harder now than it was when i started and we joke about all the time like that one bedroom was the shit. like <laughs> that was fun like it was like the, in, like the ignorance is bliss situation yeah. you know it's just kind of nice to have all that before this and you know we're both extremely blessed and grateful for the opportunities we have right now but you know i'll say it again and again success is simply just being able to continue to do what we do every single day and we still keep our heads down we still have the same mindset um nothing's changed yeah I think too the the part that you you didn't hit on, which I think is important, and I found this with me. There's got to be an almost delusional mm-hmm. self like thought that like of course I'm going to make it. There's like yeah. that unshakable inner belief that of course a kid from Beaverton, Oregon, would come down here and become you know, a successful artist, like, why wouldn't he, you know, mm-hmm. Donnie from Santa Barbara, of course, why wouldn't a kid who used to print t-shirts yeah. in high school, like, of course he would have a wildly successful brand. Mm. Like, so you guys obviously had that and every successful person I've ever talked to. Yeah. So I've, somebody told me like, you have to be almost delusional. I think so. Yeah. You really do. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like genuinely, I can speak for myself and I think a lot of my friends that I have as well is that we've really put in the work over and over and over again. And, you know, I show up to this studio five days a week, even the days that I don't want to paint just to learn more about what I'm doing. And if it's not painting, I'm developing something else. And people are like, yo, are you ever going to take a break? It's like, yeah, I'll take a break when I feel like I'm getting to the point of where I want to see this really come to life. And Mm -hmm. I don't think that's ever going to end. I think that you just continually keep building. And I don't think it's like a workaholic syndrome or anything like that. I think when you're passionate and love what you do and you really have that, maybe that knowing, um, you want to you do it every single day and you want to get better and better at what you do. Um, I love learning. Learning is the biggest thing in the world to me. And every day that I'm in here, I learn something new about myself. I learn something new about art and I learn something new about technique. And that's like the highest high I could ever have. That's like the most amazing part of my life every single day. So you're, you're, you're doing the deal. You're painting. Yeah. Right? No one cares. <laughs> no one gives a shit. Right? Yeah. What's your first big break? Um, First big break, I would say I had, uh, I met like a friend. Mm -hmm. I say friend now. At the time, we were kind of getting to know each other. Um, And he was like, you know, I'd love to buy one of your pieces. And I was like, okay. And it was like this big old piece. And I was Mm -hmm. like, 
you know, you, here's a thousand bucks. I'm like, oh man, like a thousand bucks. Like, <laughs> I got rent. This hell yeah, yeah. Like this is, this is big. Like that's like a lot of work at the Chateau. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. And um, he, he bought the piece. He put it in his house. His parents saw the, the art piece as well. Hmm. And then um, his parents contacted me and said, hey, you know, I, I'm so-and-so's parents. I'd love to come by the studio. Boom, they came by and they're like, you know, what, what do you want to sell these for? Well, hold on, pause. Yeah. You're not selling the story enough, right? Yeah. Who, what do they roll up in? Oh, it's like, you know, it's like first time I've seen like a nice like Rolls Royce or something yeah, like that. Yeah, they roll up in a yeah, Rolls yeah. with like a driver or something. Yeah, just, or something, I was right? like, but it was like classy. It wasn't like this flashy thing. It was just like, it was a classy moment. It sure. It was very like highbrow. It was, it was beautiful. And I was, you know, I was in this, I, I finally kind of skipped this part. I was in this small studio space above Hollywood Boulevard, like mm -hmm. right on the Star Walk. Um, it was, you know, 10 by 10 foot, could barely fit like three paintings in there mm -hmm. and was just in there like chain smoking and like trying to paint <laughs> and figure out what was happening. And I was kind of starting to find the language that I'm working in now um, in a primitive way back then. And so I had about four or five paintings and this moment happens where like my friend at the the new friend at the time bought the piece. His parents then come in, um, you know, were very supportive, very like, this is, this is really incredible what you're doing. Like, yeah, we'd love to help support you. We like what you're doing. Um, you know, what would you want to sell these for? And I'm just like, you can have them. Like, that just means the world that you like them. She's yeah. like, no, like, what would be like a good price? I was like, I don't know. One day it would be cool to sell for like 8000 or something like that. Yeah. And so I remember she just like whipped out her checkbook and gave me the check. She's like, okay, I'll take this one and this one. And I was like, what so like, she eight grand each so you wrote your check for yeah 16 i think grand? I, I think it was at each or what maybe did that one feel for like at the time i mean that must have i mean been yeah all it felt like a million it felt like a million dollars like being handed to you and i think even more so than just like the transaction it was like the support from you know this woman and her husband at the highest form um early in my career knowing that they knew infinite amounts about the art world so much about artwork and so much about art history etc and they were like, you know, we want to support it and we see this be good. And, you know, the spiral effect that came from, you know, being able to be part of their collection, um, you know, really helped, really, really helped me. And like kind of from that moment, everything kind of started to slowly unfold and the tempo started to pick up. And, you know, it was a couple months after that, I was approached to do my first show. Um, and that first show had like, we rented a spot in West Hollywood on like Beverly and Crescent, I think it was. Mm -hmm um and had a, got contacted by these art dealers called coats and scary they're like we want to throw a, an art show for you boom 800 people showed up this show, 800 people? The, the show sold out two weeks before it opened and i'm sitting there like i remember i was sitting on the street on the corner they put like my name on the building they had like the the show title and it was like yeah. it was called guardians it was the first show it was like the birth of like my a lot of my narrative now and i remember sitting there like in the middle of the intersection like cars blaring just like in, in this moment of like, what has happened in the past? Like, you know, this is a year post that phone call. This is one year from that phone call. Oh my God, I was just and gonna it, ask you that. Yeah, I was just like, wow. And I'm thinking about like, damn, I've kept my head down. I've been so consistent, you know, I haven't made it about myself. I haven't made it about anything but about learning and, and, and growing. Sure. And now this is happening. And it was like, whoa, shit. boom, event happens. Everything goes well. And then I'm like, I think I'm a painter now. <laughs> I, gotta, <laughs> yeah. I, gotta, I gotta do this. Um, and things just started going after that. Like that was like, I think origin, like the first couple year origin story Yeah. of, you know, the start of it all. There's also a lot of stuff on that credit card from the past that you gotta pay off. So it wasn't like you're just making a ton of money. It's, um, you know, everything was about building the vision more and more and, sure. and upgrading the studio to have more space to be able to create larger pieces and, and, and find ways to travel, to meet galleries and meet, art dealers and, and stuff like that and connect with collectors. Um, so it wasn't like a, a flash in the pan, like we made it. It yeah, was yeah. like, oh, this is real. There's we a lot more we do. have to do. And, and it's still that it's still, it's still, you know, hard and still a process, but been so lucky with how many people have come along to support and be part of the journey and have lifted me up and, and helped and been patrons and, and all that. Now, you know, you're, I think you've done a really good job and I've read some articles. I mean, I love you, man. Some of these people are so boring, the people who, I guess, wrote these articles, yeah. right? Because there's such a great story behind this, mm -hmm. like, like an exciting story, you yeah. know? And it's kind of like artified. I don't know if that's like a word. Understandable, like, You yeah. know, there's kind of like some pretentiousness kind of, it seems mm -hmm. like, associated with that. But it also seems like, and again, I know nothing about the art world at all. Yeah. But from an outsider, it goes, you go, 
you really got to brand yourself like very like thoughtfully and like because you're you you I guess you could do it would be easy to have that first show and do a quick money grab to create you know your artist Instagram page yeah to start making merch like you know hey yeah. what if I, I could sell hoodies too all the time like yeah you could easily do have the went, commercial aspect to it all for sure yeah you know but you didn't and you i think you've done a really good job of positioning yourself as a premier brand mm. not just your artwork but like you personally i guess they're intertwined if you're an artist right you are kind of the art and vice versa right yeah did that first you know the your friend's mom who was in the art world did she help you kind of navigate that or is that something yeah. you knew or? yeah definitely i i mean i've always i've always you know i struggled in my past with like pretty heavy like from like 16 to 20 i'm 29 now 16 to like 25 like really bad panic disorder and oh, like wow. had really crazy anxiety um and earlier in like late late high school time like it got really really bad and so i've always kind of had this kind of i don't want to say self-consciousness but like i'm kind of afraid to be really out there with For who sure. i am and like i've always tried to be more private and um when I kind of started to have that moment, I remember the day after my show, I, uh, there was like an article that came, like two articles came out and I think it was like hype beast or something. And I remember, oh, nice. I, I remember I was sitting with my mom and dad in this Airbnb and I had like a full blown panic attack. Cause I was so scared about like my name being out there and like having, like when people say like, you're putting your, your heart out there, it's your work. It like really hit me. I remember I had a full blown panic attack with my parents and my parents like, everything's all right. But like, like what, what's going on? I'm like, yeah. I'm freaking out. Like, this is scary. Like I almost don't want my image to even be associated with the art. I want the art to speak for itself. And, um, I remember when that woman that bought my first piece, I, I, you know, I really drew near to their family to ask advice and they connected me with advisors and people that had been in the art world for years and years to try to help me understand, like, you know, we're not going to do this right away. We're not going to push this giant commercial brand because that's not who you are as a person. That's not where your art's, you know, directed. That's not the narrative you're trying to say and, and, and share. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, I had, I'd say five to 10 people right off the back that kind of came in and, and I was like, I think you guys are safe. I think you guys are good. And then you kind of <laughs> yeah. weed them out and you pick five or six of them. And my entire career so far, I've, I've, I have weekly phone calls with these people. I'm constantly getting advice and, and, and help when I need. And it's been a beautiful thing. So what is that? So, okay, you, you have your first show, you sell it. Okay. Yeah. Like, I don't even understand. And none of us do watching this. Yeah. Like what the progression of a, like a, you know, high end artist is. Yeah. So you have your first show. Like, is there a goal in mind to get in certain auction houses or something? Like what's the, mm. what's the goal for you? Yeah, as an artist? I mean, like, I need to get here. Yeah. What is it? I think it, there's no set plan. Like you can read all these books about like, you know, how to do this in the world or how to be this. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there really is this like linear path of how to be this successful artist there's so many different avenues to be able to be successful and going back to the word success is determined of your definition of that for sure but you know for me it was right after i did that first show and it was like you know independent art dealers we rented a space it wasn't like uh, a physical brick and mortar gallery that kind of people knew mm -hmm. i always wanted to be represented by certain galleries i had them in mind for years and i knew that there were certain galleries that i needed to show with in order to kind of work my way through the academia of the art world and I didn't want to just try to shoot for the stars and like do all this stuff myself I really wanted to because I didn't study art in college I wanted to gain the kind of academic knowledge of you know what does it look like to navigate this world and how do I protect my artwork so it's not just accessible to everyone and anyone who wants to kind of use and abuse it and flip it on auction houses how do we how do we protect something that I've poured my heart into for years in order for it to be a point of longevity where you know institutions and museums someday are like hey we'd love to have this in permanent collections i think that's the goal for a lot of artists especially kind of in in my path is like obviously you want museums you want institutions you want big family collections or public collections to show your work because there's a permanence to it um and that's important because the moment you sell art it's it's really out of your hands and things can happen and be traded and flipped and all that and it gets scary because it kind of kind of sucks to be like ah you know like yeah uh, you be kind of become this token um token of equity or something and um, it's a transaction yeah and so that's why i've been so focused on like like we talked about it off camera but like longevity and slow growth you know and there's nothing sexy yeah, about that it's not i mean 
you're always fighting the devil in your head, right? Up There's the all, cash. Yeah, yeah. The that's, I, don't, I don't care in. who you are. That's always that's always going to be something, of right? Of course. And I'm fortunate that I'm able to still do what I do and be able to, you know, have a team around me, have advisors around me, be able to, you know, pay for my things that I can operate with and my tools and my supplies. And that's that's where I'm happy at right now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, God willing, in the future, the things start really unfolding. It's going to be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about you just hinted at it too. I've got my mental illness story. I actually just mm. made a video about it. Uh-huh. It's extensive, right? Yeah. But uh, talk about you mentioned having panic disorders too. Yeah. I mean, mental illness. It seems like now you're you're of the generation where you're kind of lucky in a sense that it was kind of talked about. Yeah. Like it's not odd now to say like I had a panic tour, uh, you know, yeah. attack. Like the person watching this goes, oh yeah, I had a panic attack. Or, oh, I remember that yeah. Thanksgiving where my aunt freaked out and she had a panic attack. Yeah, right? yeah. It's like something that's kind of talked about. Like mm-hmm. for me, no, when, no one even talked about or even talked about going yeah. to therapy, you know. But for you, like, how did you work through that? Was there a stigma associated with it, or was it, like pretty open? I mean, I. I think anyone around me knows that I'm like an external processor. Like I think, I think, I think. And then the moment like something comes up, I, I, where do, how do I get help with this? Where do I go? Blah, blah. blah. And I've been like that since a kid. Um, But when it got bad, like 17, 18, 19, even 20, I was, I was, I remember I was in counseling three days a week, three hours a day. Oh, damn. And it was like after school, like go and get your mind fixed. Like my, I remember my mom and dad were just like, you know, shout out mom and dad. They were so <laughs> loving and caring during this point. But like, I remember seeing their face like scared. Like when you see your parents scared for there. you and you just can't get out of it. And it's day after day after day, just trying to find someone that can help. Um, it was a long journey. And it's still something that I battle with at certain times. I think, you know, after you spend <laughs> three college years or something like that, hypothetically in, yeah. in counseling, um, you kind of have a better grip on it, but I don't think it's anything that goes away. And if anything, I, I've started to look at a lot of the anxiety from my past and, you know, panics and all this different stuff as more of a blessing looking forward because it right. really grounded me. It, it, it took me to be like, hey, we're not going to come out like this. Like you can't, you physically can't because the moment you do this, you get humbled because you're freaking out in this crowd or yep. you're like thinking you're the man and then boom, you're back down. And so it really kind of always kept me here and, and made me so much more sympathetic to people around me because you start to pick up when you have stuff going on, you can start seeing like, I know this guy's feeling the same way or this girl's feeling the same way. And you're able to kind of create this, like it's like almost like this like ground framework around you mm-hmm. of being able to extend your knowledge to help people and ultimately that helps you with your own stuff and it's it's been beautiful to watch it's funny i i completely relate to mental illness kind of you know it sucks <laughs> you know mm-hmm. they, overall it was it was painful for me but yeah. it did make me more empathetic because yeah I've been through all that, like, yeah. I, you know, three months where I can't get out of bed. Like, so I, when I see somebody, you know, where other people just go, just, I showed up to work, like, just go work out today. Like, what's the problem? You feel better. It's like, yeah. dude, you don't I know. can't even brush my teeth today. Yeah. Like working out seems like a monumental task. You might as well yeah. ask me to climb Mount Everest, right? Yeah. So like, I come at it not like that person. Like, mm. no, I, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I've been there. I've had a panic it's attack. Super, it's super tough. And I think like, and I, this might be like a hot top topic or like buzzword or whatever, but mm-hmm. I, I felt personally, in my opinion, that kind of over the years, almost mental health has become kind of, kind of became a, like a, a clickbait or like a cliche for sure. Where it's like I'm having anxiety or yeah. I'm having anxiety or I have OCD. OCD, and it's, it's like, like do you I get really that, have but OCD? like, yeah. at what point does it like the people that are like really like on the edge, you know, do we kind of sweep it by or even how i view it, it's like oh mental illness but and i find myself talking about it again or finding myself talking about anxiety it's like there still is those people that are actually on the verge and like on the edge and somebody like, right now watching yeah this, yeah who is on the and edge. that's the thing is like when we talk about stuff like this it can't be a cliche you know it can't be something that's just kind of like swept under the rug it's something that needs to be focused on because so many people still need that help and there's not a lot of resources for people that are in different parts of the world or for different sure. economical situations to be able to do that. Different was, cultures you know, where yeah. it's not acceptable. Yeah, yeah. yeah for and sure. it's just like, I'm happy that I've went through what I did and what I've gone through mentally and kind of come out and seen the light at the end of the, tunnel, under the, light at the, end of the tunnel and got to where I am now to be able to see those people and help them if I can. So what tools do you use? Therapy? Anything else help you? I think therapy is a great thing. Yeah, I think <laughs> therapy is great. Yeah. Like, I think 
I did a lot of it. Now every I'm, Friday, now, now the thought of it, I'm like, okay. I see you every Friday, <laughs> yeah. I go nine o'clock. Shout out, Liz. My yeah, therapist. amazing. I'll, I'll talk to you tomorrow morning. You know, every every yeah. week. So I, I think it, I else? think it's important. I, I mean, for me, when I started painting and started being in the studio, so much of my stuff like really calmed down uh -huh. because it was like, you know, it's me alone, maybe with one other person, and I spend you know ten hours a day getting to kind of just think and so much of like the anxiety and the panic or whatever it comes from being like overstimulated in this world right and we have all this injection of things coming at us and and people telling us stuff in, in comparison which is always a thief of joy oh, for and sure. it's it kills you and so I, when i kind of separated myself i was like ah i think pain is a good avenue for me which that man might have seen it was like you kind of just need to be on your own yeah and build this and spend your time alone and then come out for these moments to show your work um, it's slowed everything down for me. And I think it's the only way I'm able to live in LA because LA is so fast paced and so hectic is that my career is really getting to sit one-on-one -on -one in front of a canvas, having a conversation with That's a piece. Cool. Yeah. And it's like my own personal little like meditation for 10 hours a day. For sure. So. Yeah. This yeah. is, I get to talk to you. There's not a bunch of people around. Yeah. <laughs> I actually like when people around when we do these, but yeah. it's kind of neat. Like I just. Today, I'm just going to have like an interesting conversation with Devin yeah. for an hour today. Yeah. Like, that's my day. I'm going to mess up your whole podcast. Today. Yeah. Who's this guy? <laughs> Who cares? You know, whatever. Yeah. But yeah, I'm the same way. Like, but most days I'm sitting, I'm writing articles for Forbes, I'm yeah. booking guests, I'm doing, but I'm by myself. Yeah. You know, I'm not. And the other thing too, is you mentioned like everything being fast paced and stuff, especially in the social media world, like yeah. you're of the age where you should be posting, you know. A million times a day. And, you know, yeah. I could just imagine like if a social media manager walked in here now, they'd be like, you should post that picture right now. You should have a Snapchat series. Yeah. You should have a YouTube channel. You should be doing yeah. all this stuff. But like you're somehow, it's, I think you're a good example of thriving without living in that world. Yeah. Like it, you can still, I know it's crazy in 2023, yeah. have a successful career without blowing up overnight on social yeah it's 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 honestly a great like kind of leeway of what you're talking about is i just worked on for like probably the past eight months a series of work that was all about this idea of intimate moments being like a performance and so it was like these figures kind of intertwined and in these in these and these shapes and and structures kind of intertwined but there's always the background would be some sort of like curtain backdrop hmm. and the whole discussion for me was like so much of our intimacy that we have in life between individuals between thoughts between um, views of ourself we broadcast and you know a lot of people have talked on the subject but it's like at what point and where's the line between like intimacy and then performance and how do we keep intimate moments and thoughts true to ourselves and true to like being a beautiful beautiful moment a beautiful essence or just being like hey let's craft this moment in order to create a performance for people to be then involved in it and i think teetering on those lines is important so that whole work that's showing in new york right now actually opens today oh nice um is about that that's really cool with art too is because i'm able to interact with the ideas and thoughts that process through my mind or through conversations with people like yourself yeah. or whoever walking down the street and then being able to kind of take that in, absorb it, process it, and then regurgitate it in a way that makes sense to, you know, how I speak through my language with art. It's, it, dude, you're so right. You just made me think about something too. There's this um, YouTuber mom whose face, who's a horrible lady without getting the story and bumming everybody out. Yeah. She just got charged with like four counts of child abuse, right? Oh, geez. And... I mean, it's crazy, but to me, I've always been suspicious of family YouTubers. I'm sure there's, you know, nice, you know, good yeah, people yeah. out there doing it. But is it a performance or are we capturing the moment or mm -hmm. is everything staged or are the kids now child actors? Like yeah. my kids, I don't show on social media. My one, yeah. my, my younger one's a ham yeah. and like is like kind of a performer. You can tell she's going to do something. Yeah. So she gets in, in there sometimes, right? But I yeah. try to, my, my older one's super shy, so I do not broadcast that at all. Yeah. My wife's not very public. You know, I put myself out there, but yeah. they didn't ask for this. So, you know, so I understand what you're saying. Like, mm. even somebody watching this, you know, when you're taking a picture with your friend, is it, you know, are we standing a certain way to so that we look better in the light so we'll get more likes? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. The camera's always on. You mentioned a backdrop, like there's a curtain behind us. Yeah. Well, there's kind of a curtain. Well, obviously now there's a curtain because there's three cameras and mics yeah, out there. Yeah, of us, right? But whenever we have our phone out, yeah. there's kind of a curtain behind us too. Yeah. So it's it's, it's, it's one wild. of those like never ending thoughts because it's like you can talk about something about 
being like private and then we do something like this which is not private right yes so then you kind of feel like an imposter we're being public yeah, talking yeah, about something it's private a, yeah. it's a never-ending cycle and i think that's the hard part is like is there a privacy anymore you know can you can you can you even talk about privacy in a public setting without sounding you know hype <laughs> hypocritical yeah. um but it's just um i think so much of our my you know, especially my generation was instructed to kind of show everything and yep. like be seen and now i think there's just such a a luxury and mm -hmm. being private and i think there's more pull for people that are like wait what's going on in their life like why don't we know what's going on why don't we know what's going on it's yeah. like okay it's okay not to know <laughs> yeah and it's okay not to have to show everything um and that's something i struggle with with art all the time is like i don't post a ton you know i i do probably more so than some but yeah I don't want to show every part of my lifestyle. I want my art to speak for itself. I want that narrative to cap, like to gain its traction and go. And yeah. I'll pop up here and there where I can. But like, I don't need to be in front of a camera every single day. I don't need to be like, hey, look at me. You know, it's yeah. just this is what's important to me. Yeah. And 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 building this and and creating a platform where subjects like mental health and this and this and this can all be talked about. This is an avenue um, and a symbol for so many thoughts and ideas um, that I hope really like stay permanent for, for years to come. So what inspires you? Like when I came in the first time, mm -hmm. you had music playing. Like, do you listen to music while you paint? Do you listen to music all day? Yeah, I like I like music. I like jazz a lot. Really? And I love jazz. I like, and I don't who know. Are your, who are your guys? Ooh, who do you like? Um, I like Bill Evans a lot. Okay. Um, there's a UK guy. He's a little more new school. Alpha Mist. Uh, I love his music a lot. And this guy I've been listening to probably for like the last year a lot. Not really jazz, but it's an artist named Dijon. Um, I love what, I love his sound. Like I probably know every song at this point. So okay. he's great. Um, but yeah, I mean, sometimes it's nice being, I mean, you can hear when it's, the cars aren't going by, it's quiet. And yeah. sometimes it's nice just to sit here and hear the sounds of making art. What inspires you? Like, is it books you read? Like, where do you come up with that mm. idea? Well, first of all, let's take a painting like this behind us, right? Yeah. So what's the inspiration yeah, behind so this? this? Like, what does it mean? This, pain, this painting I've had in here for a long time, it's, I, I have always kind of felt like this was, it was one of the original figures that I made that kind of like started everything. Okay. And, um, you know, tying back to my studies of world religion, um, so much of the conversation was what separates everyone through these sure. worldviews. And for me, I wanted to find an identifier that people could relate to rather than creating distance between people. How do we bring it together through the idea of finding one single identifier? And for me, it was like after studying the world religions and spending time in places like Haiti and Jerusalem and oh, wow. you, know, you name it, going to really dive deep into like cultural, you know, ideas. I realized that there's always this kind of craving and need for some sort of spiritual protection or protection in general. Mm -hmm. um, even religious or non-religious, we still have friends or family members or a dog or a, you know a deity that we see that helps us in these times of need. And for me, it's consistent across everything that I've studied. And so I kind of coined it was like, it's either man, animal, or deity, or man or woman, animal or deity. Mm -hmm. And when I started painting, I wanted to find a symbol or a way to blend those three things to create this idea of a protector that regardless of your beliefs or regardless of your worldviews, when you place it in a home, it has this idea of huh. protection. So for me, this was like on the first show was called Guardians. And it was a symbol of these figures that were supposed to be representations of, you know, you have a certain set of beliefs. I have a certain set of beliefs. Mm -hmm. I see that in this and you'll see that in this. And it doesn't have to be the same, oh, cool. but it's the idea that we need this protection and guidance in life to kind of get to wherever we want to be. Nice. Just as I've had it in my career, and I'm sure you've had it. Sure. Struggles and mental oh. health or you name oh, it. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. So what's your career look like now? Like how, you know, you're successful like where can we find your stuff like what are you up to like what yeah i mean does the future look for like for you yeah i mean i've uh i had a show two months ago in la it was a show at uta it was something i was working on for a while next year that's very hollywood look at you <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that's about as hollywood nah. united tar uh, what united talent, talent agency right yeah. for the rest of us who don't live in this world yeah there was a it was a beautiful experience the, the, the gallery space there and the team that they have were people that I've, I've looked up to and loved for years the space is amazing they have a great program um i think they're very um inclusive with who they bring in and it was an opportunity i kind of wanted to do I did some shows in New York and, and select kind of group shows and fairs all over the world for the past couple of years. 
And then I wanted to come back and do one final show in LA before doing a lot of international tour next year. Oh, wow. Um, doing some stuff in New York, then New York again, and then going into Sweden and then looking like Korea at the end of the year. Um, wow. I'll have more announcements on like specific galleries of where that's all showing, but really excited for what's happening. Um, and yeah, I mean, you can follow me if you want, but yeah. I, don't, I don't post a lot. So I know, I know. After that. just like, <laughs> yeah. you know, bad mathing social for yeah. the last half hour, you know, follow me, I guess. Cut that, cut that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Where can we see your stuff? Just on your socials, on Instagram? Yeah, or? social. And then I just, I think the best place, I always feel that art is best viewed in person. So when, I do, when I do exhibitions, I think that's always the best place to see them. Oh, okay. Actually, one more thing too, before we wrap it up. Yeah. Digital world, right? Mm. And we were talking before, NFTs, 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 right? <laughs> yeah. Which, who knows? I don't know if they're coming back or whatever after they all crash. But like, is there a thought, like, I understand kind of what you're trying to build and stuff, but okay, the person in Ohio watching this goes, I'm never going to go to Sweden and yeah, I don't yeah. even know like how to get to an art gallery. Like, so yeah. they'll never see this in person. Yeah. So what do you have for them? Like, is there a way or is there a thought, like, how do you bring that person along for the ride or like into your world? Yeah, I mean, digital space, I've done work in that atmosphere mm -hmm. it's i think the technology aspect behind it is beautiful i think about you know the permanence in that kind of blockchain technology is something that drew me in mm -hmm. i think there's a lot of interesting ideas that can be used through ai and um you know creating forms of your art and references for your art through these processes but um you know i'm still developing ways to kind of create more inclusiveness to the art and accessibility cool. i guess um but for right now, I think that just my focus is is painting and continuing to paint and, and going through the process of, of showing with galleries that I feel connected to and people that I feel connected to. Nice. Well, thank you yeah. so much, man. Thank you. The wildest origin story yeah. of like, I think six years or five or six years of doing this. Yeah. I mean, it's the wildest one I, I think it. I've heard. So. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications. New interviews every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And we go live now Tuesday and Thursday, Tuesday and Thursday nights at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. We've got merch. Check it out in the YouTube shop or the levelupshop.com. Thanks, guys.